Um, so thanks for coming out this evening. I am going to be your moderator, Jim Nettles. I am a lot of different things. Um, but for purposes of this, I do a great deal of business and technology consulting work. Um, I have worked internationally. Um, I work with a number of international clients still, uh, including in and out of Europe. Um, and frequently we're working with clients dealing with GDRP, uh, dealing with how things are structured, what, are, what they're doing, what's going on. Um, so I'll be coming at this kind of from the business and implementation standpoint and the problems we see as well. So Rich? Hi. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I know there's a lot of stuff going on and really glad to have you here. So I am a data privacy attorney by trade, um, which started in 2013 because I was the only person in my current company that knew what a Bitcoin was um, and ended up leveraging that into kind of a cyber insurance type role handling claims and incidents on behalf of um, private and public companies. So certified data privacy attorney, like I said, with the International Association of Privacy Professionals, uh, but I'm coming at GDPR from a post breach perspective. So I deal with a lot of entities, both US domiciled and overseas, that are dealing with um, the breach of personally identifiable information as defined by the GDPR and kind of what the, the risks and consequences to such a breach actually entail. And Bailey. Hi, uh, I am Bailey Sanchez. I'm a lawyer and policy counsel at the Future of Privacy Forum, uh, which is a nonprofit think tank uh, based in DC. One of our core uh, principles or ideas that informs our work is that technological innovation and strong privacy safeguards can coexist. Um, and then as the name suggests, uh, forum, so we convene uh, diverse stakeholders from companies, policymakers, advocates, and academics to kind of um, advance principled da uh, data practices. So um, I'm coming to this from the perspective of, so I work in policy, kind of like knowing what, what the talking points are, what like the future and emerging trends are in GDPR, and also from what we've heard from companies that are implementing this, as well as like privacy advocates and academics that have studied this. So before we get too far started, um, Bailey, do you want to kind of give just the overview on the principles, the basics? Sure, yeah. Um, so even if folks aren't super familiar with GDPR, you have almost certainly been exposed uh, to GDPR and to its impacts. Um, so it went into effect uh, May 25th, 2018. So if you remember uh, May 2018, you probably got like dozens and dozens of emails from like every website you've ever signed up for that were updating their terms of service or privacy policy. Uh, that was because of the GDPR. Um, if you see those like cookie banners that some people may find um, annoying uh, that give you the options to either opt in or opt out, um, that is uh, typically because of the GDPR. So uh, the GDPR uh, applies to any organization re regardless of the organization's resident uh, that intentionally offers goods or services to EU residents or that monitors behaviors of individuals within the EU. Um, so it's meant to apply to EU residents, but because many companies do businesses globally, uh, they have to comply. Uh, and some companies like Amazon made the decision, you know, we are going to kind of segment off what we do and we will have like different rights for EU consumers versus uh, US consumers. Whereas uh, Microsoft made the decision that, you know what, we're just going to apply um, GDPR rights to everyone. Um, so the GDPR has seven key principles, which is lawfulness, purpose limitation, data minimiz minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, security, and accountability. But really like a key legal basis for the GDPR is to process information. Uh, you need uh, a legal basis for processing. So you can't just like, you can't collect data and do whatever you want with it. You need to have like a legal or legitimate basis for doing that. Um, so that's a very high level summary. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think that's great. Um, something I use to kind of explain it to people is if you're an EU domiciled individual, is there any information that you're giving to a company that will identify you or is identifiable to you, right? So it not, it's not like typically in a lot of US jurisdictions, it's social security number, driver's license number with address, name, things like that, right? In the EU, it could be different things. Right, like an IP address can be considered personally identifiable information in, in the EU under the GDPR. 
Um, so, and what's crazy is um, from the perspective of dealing with post breach events in the U S is you only need like one person, one client to be based in the EU to trigger GDPR compliance issues. And so, you know, it, it's a big deal, especially because, um, I don't know if, if you guys were maybe baby, I don't know if you want to chat about like privacy shield, but essentially like the EU specifically has requirements for other company, for other countries to maintain the sufficiency of their data privacy protection, like rules and frameworks. Right. So previously, the United States had something called the Privacy Shield, which was essentially a regulatory framework that said, OK, everyone, you guys can transfer data between the EU and the United States. And we guarantee that we're going to protect your rights as the EU would, essentially. Well, someone sued in the EU Court of Justice, uh, a, a, a privacy advocate by the last name Shrems, basically said, yeah, the United States doesn't actually protect privacy. And the, the EU European Court said, you're right. So the Privacy Shield framework went to the crapper and there's not actually a legitimate like existing framework for data transfer between countries. And so there's re like, you can use like uh, standard contractual clauses, which are essentially like a contractual agreement between entities that says, all right, we're gonna ensure contractually that we're gonna going to um, replicate the EU GDPR protection laws, things like that. But the problem is, is that a lot of United States companies might have EU domiciled clients or customers, but they don't have a contractual relationship with another entity. They don't have these standard contractual clauses, things like that, right? And so that can provide a lot of stress, a lot of issues, and at least from the US perspective. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't want to get too into the weeds on a philosophical level, but I think it is important to highlight the fact that uh, in in EU in the EU, privacy is considered a human right. Um, so GDPR is based on the uh, sorry. There's a there's a lot of uh, word word salad in privacy. Uh, so the European Charter uh, for Fundamental of Human uh, Fundamental Human Rights. So uh, in Europe, privacy is actually considered a human right. And that's kind of the approach that they take in the GDPR. And we just don't have that here in the US. Um, privacy is is like found or discovered within uh, the Constitution in various places, but we don't have anywhere that says like, privacy is a fundamental right. Um, so I think that's why it's an important distinction to make on why the GDPR is so much more broad and why we have had some issues uh, like with Privacy Shield and having like da data transfers between Europe and the US because uh, we have uh, quite a bit of surveillance here in the US. We have different uh, surveillance laws um, and in Europe, they're just fundamentally skeptical of the idea of data coming here to the US that it can be subject to to surveillance. Um, yeah, that's a great us. point. And so one of the, I think one of the things that we're seeing starting to really come out now is enforcement. Um, for the first few years, it was, it was more about, you know, slap on the hand, you know, don't be naughty. I mean, we have a lot of large corporate entities. I, mean, I deal a lot with FinTech, movement of money. And so this means we frequently are getting into conflict between um, the legal requirements for financial transactions and identification, um, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist act, OFAC, stuff like this, and GDRP, because there is the, what do you need to store and why do you need to store it and for how long? And we've, I've dealt with a number of cases where it is having to argue and say why certain things have to be kept um, in these cases. And what we're starting to see now is more enforcement. Um, one of the bigger things that I, I'm you know, aware of is uh, specifically like Facebook and social media companies that are trying to, you know, it, it is a direct conflict with their business model. Um, you know, if you look at Facebook, Facebook ads, some of their response to how they've now rebuilt their marketing and advertising, um, not only was because of Apple and Google um, not capturing data for them the same way anymore, but also because of suits out of uh, out of the EU 
about the kinds of data that are captured, how it's kept, how it's put. And that has actually had a very direct influence on how those technologies are being modified and designed because social media was designed to identify the person in many ways um, as are a number of other companies. So when we look at how companies are responding to the GDRP, um, you know, I think everybody's painfully been through the thing of at least something with email, you know, and knowing that when you sign up and subscribe, you've got a whole bunch of stuff to do. And, you know, as Bailey mentioned, talking about, you know, you, you've clicked on the website, you now see the big banners. Uh, a lot of things I do and deal with are for very small companies or even independent one person companies, things like this. And being aware and being compliant can be a challenge. So, and we've seen changes coming around out of the EU, out of Great Britain. We're even seeing some of these laws being crafted here, like California's laws around privacy that all are starting to model and look similar, but it is a little bit of a challenge. So if you guys take a look at where things stand from a compliance standpoint and some of the problems and the changes we're seeing as, the, as this is beginning to mature a little bit, I think that's led to some of the changes we see now. So anything in particular you guys want to, would like to focus on in terms of some of the latest changes that are focusing on some of the new restrictions that are going in, trying to do things to be more, I won't call it accommodating, but at least in some ways that are being more restrictive but and a little bit more global about how data is being handled. Sure. I mean... I think something that we need to keep in mind is that the GDPR allows for, was it a 30 or 40% fine, or like three, three or 4% fine percent, but that's very on substantial. their gross revenue of a company. All right. So when you look at Google, Apple, you're looking at hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, right? So it's a big, scary thing. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the GDPR has provided a blueprint and I think that as we grow in our technological society, one of the most important things an individual has is their privacy, right? How many things do we use on a daily basis for free, essentially? But what are they, what are they charging us? They're charging for our private information, right? Your Facebook app, Google apps, right? Like they are taking private data, selling it to other third parties, and profiting from it, right? And so GDPR, I think, you know, whether it's an outgrowth from, you know, just kind of the, the Bill of Rights that you had mentioned, which I think is a great point, or just the general European kind of sense of, um, you know, wanting to protect their, their the, the individual's domicile there, I think it's the right way to go, right? And we're seeing things such, and this is my personal opinion, but the United States is formulating a Data Protection Act right now, okay? And it's it's okay, I guess. Um, it's not to, I mean, there's a lot more corporate interest at play in the United States than there is in the EU, at least from a statutory framework perspective. Um, but it's, it's becoming a positive influence on the privacy of United States citizens, especially for those large companies that do have those GDPR compliance issues. Like I, I think you, you, you had mentioned, you know, it's encouraging what, what in the privacy realm we call privacy by design, right? So if you're coming up with a new product, uh, a new business, or a new framework, you want to encourage privacy by design. So again, as you're developing this thing, we want to maintain the privacy of our customers, our vendors, whoever we're doing business with. We want that to be a priority versus an afterthought, right? So like one of the things with GDPR is they require opt-in consent right versus opt out how many spammy emails do y'all get where it's like hey uh we're sending you all these marketing ma materials and stuff if you don't want this press the unsubscribe button it's like no bro i didn't want this in the first place man why are you guys sending me all these emails well under gdpr you need clear and obvious consent and it needs to be opt in so you need to opt in for marketing emails so from a compliance perspective i've seen a lot of u.s domiciled entities moving towards privacy by design because of the requirements of GDPR. Right? If you think about it from a business perspective, right, what's easier? 
to segregate by geographic location, like um, I forget the entity that you had mentioned. Amazon. Amazon. Thanks, Jeff. Um, or just as a t as a whole, say, hey, we're going to do this. And and what I recommend to a lot of my clients and insureds is pick the strictest framework, comply with that, because no matter what happens, you're going to be in compliance, right? And, and it saves money in the long run. Now, I'd be interested in Bailey's thoughts on like the policy perspective of that because like I'm dealing with actual you know, entities that a lot of times post breach and so we do a lot of remediation. So I get to go in there and say, hey, yeah, you have this privacy breach. Um, we had to retain EU counsel. We had to retain UK counsel. We had to retain US counsel to opine upon whatever it is. And they come to me and they go, Rich, okay, how can we make this easier in the future? And my answer is, again, what is the most stringent requirements or privacy framework that you work in? Match that. Well, yeah, and there's not just like the monetary, the legal risk. There's also a like a, a public relations or goodwill risk. So if you are offering a more privacy protective measure than what you're required to do, you know, I think that's something that consumers generally are in favor of. And it's like, the easy points uh, for right. a company to say, you know, like we've decided to just give everyone these additional rights that you aren't legally entitled to. I think that's a great point. And I mean, because honestly, there's a lot of companies that do a lot of the same things. Why would you want to work with a company that doesn't want to protect your privacy? You know, and I think going forward, that's something that we're going to want to hold on to. Right. Because that is. I mean, it's not specifically delineated in the U.S. Constitution. There's been some case precedent that has essentially outlined that you have a right to privacy. But, um, you know, if there's a company that's going to say, hey, I'm not going to send you any marketing things unless you opt in and we're going to protect your data versus someone that's going to say, hey, yeah, I'm going to sell all your stuff. Who are you going to work with? Yeah. Um, to just to build on to the enforcement uh, piece that you asked about, um, so the GDPR is enforced by data protection authorities within each country. Um, and the way it's set up is it's meant to be like kind of like a one stop shop. So um, like, it, for example, like Facebook's, they're like European uh, headquarters or in Ireland, I believe. So any like GDPR and, um, enforcement actions would take place um, with the Irish DPC. Um, so finding, uh, like Rich said, at 4%, that's just one of the tools that they have in their toolbox. Essentially, they can also issue reprimands, compliance orders. Um, they can suspend data flows to third party countries. Um, and then they can limit um, or ban uh, some data processing. So kind of similar to what we see here in the uh, the U.S. with the FTC, um, they sometimes issue fines, they sometimes issue consent decrees, um, like Facebook is subject to a consent decree here where they are required to, to do a whole host of things. Do you maybe want to go into what a consent yeah. decree is? Uh, yeah, it's something where you've just essentially agreed to do something. Um, you haven't gone to court, but it is uh, you've agreed to it with the FTC. Obviously, the FTC has some has some weight. Um, and if you violate that consent decree, you would then be subject to further fines. So, for example, uh, we had a panel on this yesterday, two days ago. I don't know. It's been a blur. But um, there was a panel on Facebook getting rid of their facial recognition uh, software. So because they made that public declaration and decided to do that, the only way they could take that back is if they then, like, um, reported it to the FTC like they are like they have to hold themselves to their own statements um, yeah. so yeah article 5 of the so the Federal Trade Commission has this unique power to essentially levy fines and do other administrative law based things for um, deceptive and unfair trade practices and so we don't actually have codified although I think that there's some statutory like some laws about to change this but there's no codified like privacy protection so there's not one entity that has like a statute that says you are in charge of privacy right but what the ftc has done is said hey we deal with unfair and deceptive trade practices so if you have a privacy policy that says x and then you go do y down comes the ftc ban hammer right and they do these consent decrees or say hey we're going to issue a fine we're basically going to put you on probation so for X amount of years, you need to touch base, with us, touch base with us and make sure that you're staying true to your privacy policy. And so that essentially is, is the 
the biggest like you know stick um, in the U.S. federal government's like you know arsenal right now. And, and Facebook is an interesting case, very specifically as a company, because they've come out and said they don't know entirely whether or not they can comply because of some of their data structure. Um, and uh, there has been a lot of conversation about with within Facebook as to um, can they comply? Because again, it literally could break some of the application to be compliant. Yeah, and I think it's not just Facebook. And right. I know, like you know, that there were some audience shrugs. I think when we hear that Facebook's having difficulties, people are not necessarily so uh, sympathetic. But uh, in in Europe, there have been. Um, enforcement actions and we have had uh, the data protection authority say that you know there, there's issues with using Google Analytics or there's issues with using Amazon Web Services and those two tools are kind of like like fundamental tools that are used by most businesses on the internet yeah. yeah like maybe you could speak to that better but like my understanding is like almost everyone is using uh, one or both of Amazon Web Services or Google Analytics and also, not only that, but for login and authentication on other applications. Right. So if you, uh, and because of some of these places where they're using this to credential and authenticate who the person is, um, I mean, for example, uh, if you've not done any uh, government transactions recently, um, it's been in and out and in and out and in and out as a requirement. But now one of the things that is done is taking your personal documents, whether it is your driver's license, passport, whatnot, and comparing that against social media pictures to help confirm your identity before you're able to do certain kinds of transactions on government websites. So they're using public data on social media as a part of your authentication strategy. Um, well, that is one of those things that has raised hackles for GDPR and for certain things out of Europe, because if I am a foreign national, I may be living in the US, I may be doing business in the US, I may be operating out of the US, and now I'm being required to provide data. Uh, and this is one of the things I've seen a number of, I don't know that any cases have made it through yet, but I know that there is some stuff float, uh, filtering through for European citizens that are having to use these applications to some of this public data as a part of you know, confirming identity. So pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions yet? Uh, if you'll come up to the mic. Yeah, and definitely, especially since we have a smaller group here, if there's anything you guys want to talk about, and it's not really a question, like, right. happy to raise it up and, and we can dig into a little bit. Whether it's a reaction, I don't even know. Yeah. Whether it's a reaction to the perceived fecklessness of the GDPR. Uh, you were up about a month and a half ago past the DMA and the DSA. Could you speak to both of those and what you think will happen due to a single consolidated commission that will do enforcement versus the one state, one, one agency idea of the GDPR? I can start, and then if anyone else wants to touch on that, that's fine. Um, so the the uh, he said the DMA and the DSA again. Lots of we really love acronyms uh, in the privacy world. Uh, so it's the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, and those are both also um, acts that are going to have like extraterritorial effects because again, like any business that is doing. Um, business in EU will have to comply, um, though I believe it's the Digital Services Act. No, the Digital Markets Act has like <laughs> one, or the one other. of them has like a higher higher bar, higher standard, like it's more um, for, for the Facebooks of the world versus the small businesses of the world. Um, so those are part of the uh, EU's digital strategy. So it's something that has been in the works for a while. Um, but I think from what I understand, some people are interested in that like single enforcement body versus uh, each DPA kind of uh, doing their own thing because the GDPR was meant to bring harmonization, but it, it necessarily is hard to have harmonization where you have like a host of, um, I don't remember how many countries, over 20 countries that are all interpreting legal texts differently. Um, something that we've seen is that um, the DPAs interpret uh, the fines differently. Um, it's article, I think, 83 has a list of factors to consider when you're issuing a fine. 
um, and we've seen inconsistency in how um, DPAs uh, look at those factors, even though it's meant to be, it's meant to be something that is clear for everyone to understand and be a bit more <laughs> uniform and harmonious. But that's something that's just very, very hard to achieve when each company has, or each country has its own people doing this and also their own interests. Um, and each country also has different levels of funding. Um, so I actually interned at uh, the International Association of Privacy Professionals several years ago. And one of the things I did was looking at like DPAs on the ground and like the work and the progress they had done in the first two years of GDPR enforcement and like the the funding between DPAs like varied wildly. So it would kind of be like if we had like just a ton of different FTCs here in the U.S. that were all like at varying scales uh, trying to enforce the same law. No, I, I, I think you, you absolutely killed that question because from my perspective, handling claims where we're actually negotiating with these various DPAs, um, you know, British Airways had a fairly large data breach, right? So who was the DPA for that? It was in the UK. Do we think maybe just a little bit they got some preferential treatment there because the initial fine was very, very large and the ultimate fine was <laughs> less than that. Are they a signatory on the GDPR? They were at the time. So the, for the purposes of the video, um, yeah. the gentleman asked if they were a signatory to the GDPR. Um, the British Airways fine, I believe, was pre-Brexit. So, you know, I, I think it's not a terrible thing. Um, I think it's going to provide more standardization. I love the, the word harmonization because I think that's exactly it. Because honestly, you know, if you're having a large scale data breach in the EU, why is your home country the one to decide what that is, right? When multiple other EU entity or individuals might be potentially impacted by it. And the one other thing I'd add to that too, because again, you're getting back into data, you're getting back into a lot of the corporate interests is uh, what countries you're operating in because we see both more country is coming into the EU as well as some of these countries potentially are either leaving the EU um, or maybe um, breaking up in some of these cases. So it's it, it, like you saw with Brexit, they now kind of have their own flavor of it uh, because that's the only way they can continue to play fair with the neighbors. But I think we're going to have to watch uh, what countries are continuing to come in or exit the uh, the EU potentially. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, so first, I'm the data protection officer for my co company. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, first part is, is there any real difference between the EU and the UK version of GDPR? That's one. The second is my company is solely located in the U.S., but we don't sell a product, but we do work with EU and UK citizens where we have to collect personal identifiable information to do what we do. Is there any real, what is the enforcement capability of the EU or the UK for a company that's solely located in the US with no European presence right. if there was an issue? Not that, and we're GDPR compliant, no plans to not be, right. but just asking. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to your first question, not a lot of difference. Um, it's actually called the, the UK GDPR, <laughs> um, but they, they are there are some recent amendments that they've made just over the past couple months. Um, that have kind of qualified some of the changes. But for all intents and purposes, the UK GDPR is, from a legal perspective, identical to the EU. I mean, there's some nuance there, but from a US entity perspective that is dealing with UK and EU citizens, I don't think there's one requirement that's more onerous than others. Yeah, it's not really a meaningful difference. Right. Yeah, they didn't go through their big whole process. Like, the GDPR took, like, years and years and years to come up with, and... The UK did not like go off in the. The language either. is like verbatim. Like you can literally like cross reference like Article X with Article X, and it's like identical. Um, to your second question, um, the, the the you know, so obviously from a legal perspective, at least in the United States, there needs to be um, jurisdiction over an entity, right? So if you have no, you know, if you're not at all domiciled or doing any type of business in a state, you do nothing there. They might not have, you know, jurisdiction over you, right? With the EU, they can still fine you and do everything and arguably take revenue from you 
that you get in those jurisdictions, right? Now, the question is, if your company actually gets revenue from UK and EU-based clients, do you want to piss off the entire European Union by saying, hey, we're not going to pay this fine, and they, they, they don't allow you to do business there? So, yeah, I mean, can they potentially force you to pay? Eh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm qualified enough to answer that question from like, you know, all right, if they file suit in the UK or the EU and try to come after you and you don't have any substantial assets there, but they can keep you from doing business there. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's kind of, again, the stick to, to that. Hi, uh, following up actually from, from the last question, uh, for like a small business, you know, based in the US, maybe does some remote uh, work for EU, EU or has clients or whatever. Uh, what's the, I don't, don't want to say practical risk, but um, if they're, they're breached and some files or whatever are stolen, not who comes after them, but what's the likelihood? You know, like, well, how much, you know, there's only so much resources they can have to enforce this small mom and pop shop. Like, you know, where do they weigh that out? You know, Amazon breach or like the British Airways ones, you know, you definitely want to go after, but 10 records right. getting stolen. So just curious about Yeah, that. I mean, I, I guess the question would be, are you a data owner or process, data controller so this or would data, be the data processor? Owner. Let's say the company is like a data owner. Okay. And yeah, so it's something that they're handling and gets residing you know, on their so, servers so you, or so, whatever. So, so. Your com so the company in question right. is the one aggregating personal identifiable information yeah. of EU domiciled individuals. Yeah, right? so it would fall under GDPR, but it's really how... how yeah, I mean... Do they go after I mean, tiny they, companies? They, they, they could, right? Like, it's depending sure. upon, like, the, the facts of the circumstances, right? Like... The GDPR, what we found with the DPA's subsequent like post breach, is they're going to review what happened, right? Now, if you were storing a bunch of PII in plain text on a publicly available web server, there might be an issue there. If you had a ransomware actor that brute forced a sysadmin password and then somehow corrupted backups and got access to things there and you immediately remedied it and blah, 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 it might be different, right? The key thing with the GDPR from a post-breach perspective is notice, okay? Notifying the DPAs of the, the, the location of most of your domicile customers, being upfront and honest with them. The actual language is you wanna notify without undue delay, right? And so what that means, once you've confirmed access, you want to notify. And we found that with DPAs, that if you go say, hey, we had the security failure, we're notifying you ASAP, this is the timeline, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, you'll want to retain qualified EU or UK counsel, okay, depending upon where the majority of your data is, but um, or the, the majority of the individuals who are impacted is. But they will work with you. We've not seen kind of a, a, a punitive type actions by them, right? And and the other thing too is it's like three or 4% of your gross revenue. So if you're a small shop making a hundred grand a year or even a million dollars a year, 4% in the grand scheme of things, hopefully shouldn't be that much. Well, that's assuming they even decide to fine you because right. again, it's they just might one not. of the tools and their two right, exactly. blocks and they might just give you like a, like a warning. That's a great point. So I mean, yeah. So I'm sorry. What are you gonna say I was going to actually. Sorry, I don't want to take up the. the no, you're fine. No, we, but, got, um, we got plenty of time. Uh, following up on that, like, how often do you see a, a fine accrue? Like, I, I do technical side IR, so I work with a lot of clients, and they, of course, never want to share they got breached. Right. Um, and so I, I, you know, push them to do that. But as my role for incident response, I'm the technical guy, technically helping, and then say, here's a report. Right. Um, so. Uh, how often, if you they kind of go through those motions of doing your not best, not very and... often in the SME context. Okay, we really don't see it. I mean, because the thing is, though, is from you know, I, I work for cyber insurance carrier, and so like we're advocating notice ASAP. Okay, so we don't hide the ball. We don't say, hey, blah 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 blah. It's like no, we'll even have counsel reach out to the DPA and say, hey, we had an incident. We're not sure if data was breached. We want to put you on notice. Right, and by doing that, and by communicating with them, being open and obvious with them, that does a lot, right? Like, a lot of times the large fines you see are because of other issues. 
Or? Yeah, and I think an interesting thing with the GDPR, so in the U.S., our laws are very sectoral based. Like, you know, we have FERPA that regulates student privacy. We have Graham Leach, Bliley. We have like sectoral based laws, but the GDPR is for everyone. It applies to everyone. So like there have been uh, enforcement actions against schools or small businesses. So it's like very... Uh, very different and so like yeah I, I think the fines are like usually when there's like something else going on um, has to be like more deceptive more like if okay we didn't notify you of this or oh you violated your privacy policy or things like that but if through no error of your own outside of you know the regular human error you get when there's a, a breach or a security failure and you're open and obvious about notifying you have a process by which you're notifying the impacted individuals and you keep the dpa noticed um, we've not seen a lot of fines if any at all yeah because the gdpr is very like principles based and that's just not they're, something that we have in the u.s they're so, like, humanists yeah. kind yeah, of they, they <laughs> kind put of that. like the, the way that like privacy advocates in the u.s or skeptics refer to it is like they're they reward a for effort or like you're trying so if you are if you are uh, making efforts to be gdpr compliant and you are doing your due diligence. I think that's something that's yeah. definitely. I mean, if, if you guys weren't GDPR, sorry, if no, you guys no. weren't GDPR compliant and like just flouting all these, you know, GDPR regulations while dealing with these, you know, domiciled individuals, and then you notice up notify a breach, like that could be an issue. But if you guys have done all you need to do to be GDPR compliant, and then something bad happens, they're usually pretty understanding. And there is there is a a project going on where they're trying to define a new set of security principles to be guidance um, that will provide more actionable steps to take as an organization uh, to provide more of that kind of a technology strategy for the business. Uh, sorry, one more follow up on that. When you talk about the notification, um, so I do like consulting work, so I'm coming in and helping with the IR. So there's normally a report that I'm handing over to to the clients, you know, because right. everybody's hair when there's an incident, you know, hair on fire, we don't know what's going on, theories getting thrown everywhere. Is it uh, uh, better to wait till you know the dust has settled a little bit as far as you kind of know what happened versus just saying we got this one clue we believe there's a breach so we reached out. Which, so it, which it, is kind it, of the... it really depends, right? Like from a GDPR perspective, um, and again, I would always rely upon the advice of competent legal counsel sure. in the jurisdiction where not only is this is the legal answer, right? Got it. Not only where the company's domicile, but also where any of the data. The data owners or the individuals are domiciled, right? But generally, what I've seen in my experience is if it's US based, you file an IC3.gov complaint, which reports to the, okay, FBI, the FBI that yeah. notifies the breach, right? If it's in uh, the EU or the UK, you can file a notice with, with the DPA there. And that notice doesn't need to say, hey, this is what happened, uh, or, you know, does, doesn't expect a full answer, sure. but you can put them on notice, right? Okay. Now, if it's something where you do not know that PII has been accessed, right, then you're going to want to pause a little bit, right? Yeah. Because you only, that, that definition of without undue delay is basically predicated upon there being a known access to or exfiltration of data. So if it's something where it's like, okay, we see encryption here, but we're not sure if this was something that was deployed automatically or if they were in the network for a couple of days or a week or two, yeah. right? Or was there any vertical or you know horizontal movement within the network? You can wait a little bit. What you don't want to do is say, hey, yeah, they had access to this web server that had all this PII on it. Um, let's wait till the forensic thing's complete, especially in the GDPR, Okay. under the GDPR. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thanks for the questions. I so, love that shirt, yeah. by the way. That's a great shirt. <laughs> yeah. Just for people on video, his shirt says, I don't do costumes. I'm here to get drunk. So the question I have is change of business behavior in response to GDPR. Uh, as you guys alluded to, um, in the U.S., we tend to be, our data tends to be their business model, right? Um, have you seen, excluding Amazon, since they chose a different path, have you seen not because usually it's not the technical side it's the business team that says we want this data so we know more and more have you seen uh businesses sort of business teams sort of pulling back and sort of narrowing what they're trying to gather to be more gdp gdp compliant or you know minimizing risk in case there is a breach so i i would say yes um just from my clients and insureds because Going through a, a GDPR compliance process or 
what a lot of people have done in U.S. domiciled is with the advent of the CCPA, the California Consumer Protection and Pri Privacy Act, and then now the CPRA, which amends that, um, a lot of businesses are like, hey, it's going to cost X amount of dollars to be CCPA compliant. We want to do business with the GDPR going for in, in the EU going forward. So let's just, just, just be compliant with both, right? And so I have seen um, GDPR compliance impact business decisions and impact how they're doing business, like going to opt in versus opt out, um, allowing right to be forgotten um, or deletion requests, right? Because, you know, before GDPR, if you wrote a company and said, hey, please delete this data that I voluntarily gave you, they'd probably give you a rude gesture and ignore you, right? But now companies are saying, hey, we might do business going forward in the European Union or the UK or in California, which has a right to deletion or a right to be forgotten. And so we're actually seeing that kind of impact their day-to-day -day now. Yeah. Um, Oh, no, you, uh, Hold yeah. up, real quick, while follow up on that. Have you seen a narrowing in the data they're gathering, not necessarily the yeah, opt-out? Yeah, data minimization is a key uh, principle of the GDPR, and so I, yeah, I think I would have a similar answer. Really, it, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, obviously, but like um, for any company that was large enough to be doing business in the EU, the GDPR really forced them to like kind of think about privacy for the first time because again, we don't have a federal privacy law. We have sectoral laws specific to like student financial or health information, but nothing that's just like, you know, privacy for everyone. These are the baseline standards. So, uh, yeah, companies that were doing business in the EU, EU at all, like that really forced them to at least like be thinking about privacy. And again, like, um, Rich brought up privacy by design. That's something that's being like increasingly encouraged. Um, and again, like you have to think about it from a compliance cost because it, it might just be easier and cheaper for the company to just apply the same um, GDPR protections to everyone. Uh, so yeah, d data minimization uh, is something that like we are seeing more. And, and I actually do work on projects where we look at that 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 exact thing which is balancing the blend of what is the data what's the minimum data we have to capture and store and for how long and again this is one of those things where uh, sometimes you get into conflict between what the laws are about the data that has to be held and captured and how long it has to be held and captured and then balancing that against uh, even GDPR you can go and say that this is legitimately needed for these reasons and have that coverage. But depending on what business you're in, it's becoming much more by business, by industry, the size of the company, um, what states you do business in, in addition to are you doing international. So absolutely, there's a, I mean, I've worked on a number of projects where um, instead of going in and um, just totally blowing things away, but they're they're discovering there's data in databases that they now no longer have to capture or want to hold, but because of say system structure, you can't entirely get rid of it either. That what they're doing is encrypting it in a way that even that no one can ever pull it back. But there is data there to continue to return a positive return until you can rebuild. So it again is very much about only store what you have to store and have a good argument for it. Hi again. Um, I just had a question about the conflicts between and how um, policy and organizations are navigating the GDPR and the U.S. Cloud Act. Cloud Act. Yes. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but basically, again, we're back into data. Um, and data privacy rights and so again so picture one of the things because a, one of the things that has caused and I'll go back to Facebook as an example because their data centers are distributed um, and again for things like business continuity for DR um, you know it's a little bit where we actually see companies store data internationally in, in, in centers across the world uh, so you have to be aware of where your data is actually being housed, who has access to that, because when you cross international borders, um, the U.S. kind of does like to grab data, um, as do a lot of other countries as data moves across borders. 
Um, so the Cloud Act, and I have to look it up because it's been a while since I've read through it. But pretty much it's one of these things, again, about where is the data stored, who has access to it. Uh, because, again, we sort of think of cloud servers as literally being, you know, oh, okay, well, that the, we have had people forget that that still means there's hardware sitting somewhere processing data, storing data. Uh, and there is there are pieces around the Cloud Act, again, um, so that you have to know where your data is at and making sure that certain kinds of, of non-public information do not cross borders, uh, things along those lines. I don't remember all the provisions to it. I don't know if you guys... Would there, would, so I, I will admit um, ignorance as far as the U.S. Cloud Act. So, I mean, what specifically, were there specific provisions or... You know, thoughts on, I don't know, Bailey, if you're familiar with it. Not really. I know a tiny bit more about FISA 702, but not so uh, much the Cloud Act. Yeah. Uh, one of the potential conflicts that come up frequently is the GDPR says uh, the European information is private. The, you know, U.S. law enforcement comes in and says, this is data that is owned by a U.S. company. It's stored in Europe there, but you still have to give it to us. Right. But the GDPR says, no, you don't have to give it to us. And so now there's a conflict between these two gotcha. documents. Right. And I was just wondering. Yeah, so that that actually gets to the privacy shield um, issue that Rich brought up. So privacy shield was essentially a safe harbor for uh, cross-border uh, data transfers. Um, it was found. It was over. I don't know what the terminology overturned. Uh, yeah, so there was there was down, essentially uh, essentially a case in I forget what European Union court, and it was the first one was Schrems, and there was Schrems two, and it basically said because the Privacy Act essentially guaranteed that the United States had a privacy structure that would treat European data the same or data transferred and would protect the same as it would be protected in the EU, right? So the EU has relationships with other countries, and if they have a similar privacy regulatory framework, let's look use Canada, for example, under PEPETA, um, which I do not remember what PEPETA stands for, but it's essentially their privacy regulatory st standard that they're updating. If that matches the GDPR or their general data protection statutes, then you can have intra-country intra transfers. Okay, interestingly, Canada is actually updating their privacy laws to stay abreast of the GDPR regulations to effectuate that data transfer. So we had the privacy shield, which did that, and then the European Union court said, nah, y'all don't do that. Yeah, like, and the <laughs> reason why privacy shield uh, was an issue was because of like FISA 702 and Executive Order 223 that uh, law enforcement can access um, non-US right. uh, citizens' data. Um, so there are efforts to kind of come up with, you know, like privacy shield 3.0, uh, because I believe that was already like the second uh, privacy shield. Um, and that is something that is still very much in the works because, you know, that that's why there was those like big headlines, you know, where Facebook was like, we can't do business in Europe because the issue is um, there's just, you know, uh, surveillance here in the U.S. And that threatens the, the business model in, um, in Europe because of the protections uh, laid out in GDPR. Um, so there is an agreement in principle between the EU and the U.S. That was something that uh, the Biden administration worked on. Um, but I, I think like Congress will need to make some reforms to, to FISA or to the Cloud Act um, because there are some advocates that think that, you know, once we reach this new agreement, it's just going to get struck down again and we're right. going to be at the same place. Um, and companies are really struggling on what to do because uh, data transfers and, you know, like doing business in Europe uh, when you're a U.S. based company is getting uh, increasingly difficult. And those that was also a piece of the, the underlying issue with Amazon Web Services and Google Analytics as well, because these are all U.S. businesses. Um, and so the concern is that, like, even if the data is located in Europe, it can perhaps be accessed by someone in the U.S. or there can be a data transfer. Yeah, and I wouldn't put it past the a, a DPA in the EU to find companies for following U.S. law. I really wouldn't. So, so I mean, yeah, there is an absolute conflict based upon what you said, and um, apologies for not knowing more about it, but... I mean, I, I, I think the DPA, especially after Shrems 2, would basically be like, hey, y'all are on notice here. Um, if you're going to continue doing business here, you need to, you know, satisfy and qualify by our laws. And I, I don't know how much you guys might know about it, but I remember there were some issues 
with the FISA courts having to disclose um, some of the closed warrants because of the data they were trying to grab. No, unfortunately. Yeah, no. I, mean, I wish Amy was here. Amy yeah. would have so much to say about this. Yeah. Um, so most of the discussion is on the big companies that should have resources to do, deal with some of this. What about the, the couple in their garage doing Etsy, sending something to somebody living in France? It How works. are they supposed to have a data protection officer, uh, uh, whatever else? So the, the question would be is what type of information are they aggregating, right? Okay. Typically under the those types of, well, yeah, but <laughs> at name and address might not be personally identifiable information or GDPR. Um, it's identifying, but it might, you know, it, 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 there's a little bit of nuance there. I think, you know, especially as Etsy is the one that's processing the payment. So any payment information goes to Etsy. So Etsy has to be GDPR compliant, but the seller on Etsy probably doesn't have to be, right? Because again, GDPR does have much more stringent requirements and definitions for personally identifiable information, but a name and address that you can Google and that's publicly available might not satisfy that. Now, that's not to say it doesn't in some circumstances because the GDPR is crazy, but you know, it just name and address for purposes of a commercial transaction typically isn't considered PII. Uh, and yeah, because uh, sorry to cut in. No, you can go. Um, so, and this is some of the things that we do um, is work with small businesses, small companies. This is one of those things where it's also good to just know whose platforms you're working with. So using Etsy as an example. So let's say you also are building a mailing list. So you've got an email list that you're using a service. Generally, if you are using services that are compliant, you'll be covered as well. Unless you take the data and do something else with it externally beyond what your stated use was of the information. Yeah, that's all I was going to say. From a practical standpoint, in that circumstance, someone uh, provided, like voluntarily provided their name and information uh, in order to receive a service. I think a lot of like the the day to day privacy concerns that people have, or you know, when information is being collected on them that they don't know about, didn't consent to. Um, so as long as that couple isn't doing anything nefarious with the name and address, I think it's probably. How does Brexit affect uh, GDPR compliance with doing businesses that are solely based in the UK versus the EU so in whole? Brexit. Um, Brexit, yeah. yeah um, I, how, how does that affect it? I believe the UK also has to get its own adequacy decision now, right? They do, but I mean, they're going to get it. So and what she means by adequacy decision is what I talked about earlier about the EU says, hey, other countries outside of the EU, do you adequately protect the data privacy of EU domiciled individuals? And so as we said, um, I, I, I challenge you, if you would like, if you have time after some drinks, because you'll need them, um, Google the UK GDPR and then the EU GDPR and cross-reference the things, okay? Cross-reference the provisions, the articles. They might be different numbers, but the vast, vast majority of them are identical. It's very similar, okay? So I think um, post-Brexit, the, the impact is, is not negligible but it's also much less, it's much easier to transfer intra-country between the EU and the UK than it would be from the EU or the UK to the United States. So and I think we're actually out of time. Um, I appreciate everybody coming and joining us this, this evening. Thank you for all the questions. They were fantastic. Great, great questions. Hope that you found this helpful. Uh, please remember to help rate us in the app. So if, you, if this is the sort of thing you like to see and hear and get these updates, please make sure to let everybody know that. And of course, don't forget, Give us all your hundred dollar bills for the. Uh... Also, I have some iHeart privacy stickers up here. If anyone would like some. I want one.